What's up guys and welcome back to Mon Inc. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Heya! How you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here to hear about how stupid Odysseus's men are because believe me it's shocking. Well then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video and as you can see from the title we're going to be going into book 12 of Homer's Odyssey. So if I could summarize book 12 into a one sentence it would be that Odysseus's men eat the castle of the sun which is the dumbest Genuinely guys, it is the only thing, one of the only things in this entire book that everybody is like, hey, don't do this. And the men still decide to do this. And so you just, you get to this point and you're just like, you know what? They kind of deserve to die. A little bit, won't lie. Anyways, to make all of that make some sense, why don't we just roll into the narrative? So where I left you in the last book was that the men had gone down to the underworld, they had spoken to all the ghosts and all of this, and one of the ghosts that they spoke to was this guy called Elpinor, who had died on Circe's island. Now he had instructed Odysseus and the men to go back to the island to give him the correct burial rites because they didn't do that before, which is obviously a really bad thing in the ancient world because it means that you get like stuck in some like underworld limbo thing. So at the beginning of this book, all the men go back to Circe's island to give Elpinor the correct burial rites. Now, if you want to know or if you need to know for class, all of the ways that the men have to do this because Elpinor gives them direct instructions of what to do, then either read the book or watch my previous episode. I don't care which one it is, but you'll probably have to know and I'm not gonna go into it again. Anyways, as they do this, Circe shows up with all of her handmaidens to give them bread, to give them wine, to, you know, make them comfortable on the island. She's very happy to have them. And she tells them that they should actually stay on the island until the morning, that way they can be well rested. And she's more than happy, again, she's more than happy to have have them. So she tells them just sleep on the beach, sleep on the boat. I don't really care, but just stay here until the morning. And all the men are very happy and so they stay. Now when all the men have gone to sleep, she actually pulls Odysseus aside because she wants to know all the details and she has some things to tell him, which are very, very important to the rest of his journey. So Odysseus tells her word for word pretty much exactly what happened down in the underworld and she's very happy. She's very proud of him, but she's happy to also be in the know. And she says, okay, great. Now that you've told me all of that, I'm very thankful, but this is not the end of your journey. I'm very sorry to be the bearer of bad news. She warns Odysseus right now that he's going to come into contact with three basically three big monsters and then there's going to be like a last stop which is very important well we'll start with the first stop the first stop is going to be the sirens so they're going to come across the island of the sirens and if you don't know what the sirens are oh actually actually i went to the british museum the other day and i took this photo because there was a little statuette of what a siren looked like i feel like a lot of people think that sirens are like these beautiful mermaid women and they're like all sexy and all of this and like no they were like birds with women heads right so that's what they look like like in Greek mythology. And um, they're gonna go past this island of the sirens. And what she tells him is that the sirens are going to sing this beautiful song, because this is what they do in mythology. And they're going to try and lure him and all of the men to the island so that they can become well, bird food, basically. <laughs> They're gonna become food for the sirens. The sirens are gonna kill them and it's not gonna be pretty. This is what happens when sailors are unprepared for the sirens. But Odysseus will be prepared. So Circe advises him that in order to get past the sirens safely, what he's going to do is cut up all of this beeswax to soften it and to plug his men's ears with it so that they will not even hear a little glimmer of the song is the whole point of that. And she says that if he, if Odysseus is so hell-bent set on hearing the siren song, which he might be, he might be curious and that's fine, that what he should do is he should have his men tie him to the mast of the ship, like hand, feet, waist, everything. That way, if he wants to get off the boat, if he wants to steer the boat or anything like that, he won't be able to move. And she tells him to tell his men that even no matter how much he cries, no matter how much he pleads, they will not let him go. They will not untie him. They will not let him do anything in that moment. He is stuck on the mast. After the island of the sirens, then Circe tells Odysseus that him and his men are going to have basically a fork in the sea without it actually being a fork in the sea, that they can choose one of two ways to travel in order to get to their final destination without it sounding like really terrifying. So the first way is going to actually be one way that only one ship has ever survived. It's like this terrifying mountain basically where the sea is just really rough and so every time people manage to get their boats through them then the boats just get smashed up against the rocks and everybody dies the boats are shattered to pieces and all of this and she says the only boat that has ever made it past these terrifying rocks is Jason and his Argo which is a very big mythological moment however that is nothing to do with the story so if you need to know or if you want to know uh, about Jason and his little Argonautica then go and read that book that's a whole other different book I'm not explaining it here anywho the other option is that it's going to be this sort of pathway in between these two monster issue things right so on one side she describes that there will be 
um, this this like hole in the sea, basically a whirlpool, but she doesn't say that. There will be a hole in the sea that sucks in the water and spits it out, right? So again, a whirlpool. And that is called Charybdis, right? So that's what that is gonna be doing. It's gonna be this moment. Whereas on the other side, there is a another sort of rock face and in sort of the middle of it, there's a cave. Now in this cave lives the monster and the monster is called Scylla. Now Scylla has like 12 legs and six really long necks with like these little heads at the end of it, which have all these fangs in it. And in fact, she yelps and she barks like a dog and she won't move from the cave. So she's very much a stationary monster, which I don't know how terrifying that is, but you'll see in a second actually. So she sits in her cave and the heads sort of shoot out and the heads themselves will pick up like dolphins and dogfish and all of this. And basically Cersei says, if she sees men, she gonna be hungry. So be prepared. Now this is gonna be really difficult, right? Cersei does not mince her words whatsoever, but she says that her advice to him is that because the boat, if it goes too close to Charybdis, it will be sucked into the whirlpool, that, you know, the best bet for him is to go a little bit closer to Scylla, risk having six of his men killed, rather than having the whole boat go under for the sake of saving six men, if that makes sense. So that's what she tells him to do. And obviously Odysseus being Odysseus is like, could I not just fight off Scylla? What if I get my armor on and I try and like fight the heads and all of this? And Cersei's like, that's dumb. Don't do that. You're just going to waste your time putting on all your armor. And then she's going to end up killing all of you anyways. So just, just don't even bother. Just go a little bit closer. Make sure you're sailing really fast. It should be fine. Now the last stop that she tells him about, which is the most important stop, is she says you, Odysseus, are going to come across the island which holds the cattle of the sun. Now these cattle are like Helios's prized possession. The way that I need you guys to realize the importance of this is you know when you see like on TV, there's like old men, or maybe you know one of them, an old man who's bought like a car that's like his prized possession, right? And he's like at home and he's wiping that thing down every single day and he's given it a name and he loves that car so much. That is how Helios feels about his cattle, right? Like he loves that. And Cersei warns Odysseus right now, like this is his little prized possession. Don't touch it. Make sure your men don't even harm the cattle. Like we're talking about a scratch. Like if even one cattle, if even one of the stupid little cows or one of the stupid sheep gets a scratch on it, then none of the men will make it home. She's like, trust me, you're all gonna die. Maybe you'll survive, but your men certainly won't survive and you will go home a broken man. She tells him right now that even though Helios isn't down on the island to watch his own cattle, that he has sent his daughters to go and do it and these minor deities to make sure that the cattle is alive and thriving. So she's like, he's gonna find out one way or the other. So just avoid it at all costs. Now Odysseus says thank you, obviously, because what she just gave him was like incredible advice. And then the dawn rises, so morning rises. And so Odysseus leaves Cersei and he goes back to all of his men who are now, you know, on the boats. And so he tells all of them to, you know, pack up all their stuff from the beach, get on the boats and all of this. And Cersei, Meanwhile, goes off, she goes home. So the wind starts guiding the boat through the ocean. And that is when Odysseus sort of tells his men about the next stop. So he tells them about the sirens and he says, it's not fair that I'm the only one who knows what's gonna happen right now. And so he warns about the sirens. And as he's telling them, all of a sudden the wind stops. The boat, all of a sudden, it gets very peaceful, gets very quiet. And they know what's coming in this moment. They're just like, it's probably not a good idea. So all the men start, they go and they sit down by their little oars and they start, you know, actually uh, sailing the boat manually rather than having the wind just push them. Well, Odysseus is cutting up all of the beeswax and plugging his men's ears. So he's walking around the ship and he's doing all this stuff and he's telling them that he wants to be tied to the mast of the ship. So all of them know and they start tying him up on all of this. And as the boat is approaching, the sirens start to sense them coming. And this is when the sirens start singing directly to Odysseus. So he's now bound to the mast, right? Mans can't move. This is very famous on pottery. We have this depicted everywhere, pretty much in the ancient world. It looks like this. And so Odysseus is stuck to the mast and he starts hearing the siren song and he is totally enchanted by it because they are calling directly to him saying that they understand his pain because they understand what happened with the Trojans. They understand what happened with the Greeks. They understand that whole war and they get what happened to him. And because of that, they want him to come to the shores because there is no way that he can pass them without hearing their song, which is incredibly smart and incredibly manipulative on their part. They're just like, no sailor has ever made it past us without sitting with us and without actually talking to us and listening to us. And Odysseus falls to the trap that he just starts screaming on the boat. He's telling his men to untie him. He's just like, no, we have to go. We have to go to these sirens. Like apparently their voices are like honey, like it's smooth, it's rich, it's sweet. And obviously Odysseus's men, because they can't hear it, they are not taking any of his bullshit. 
And so in fact, Yuri Locus and Perimedes, two of the guys who uh, played a major role in the underworld, they come forward and they just start tightening Odysseus's ropes around him. They're just like, absolutely not, you're not going anywhere. And luckily, thanks to Cersei's advice, they just end up rolling past the island of the Sirens. So they're all pretty proud of themselves, right? In this moment, they start like unplugging their ears and they're like, look at what we just did, we're so tough. But now Odysseus knows that he has to warn them about what they're going to come across. So he gets up in front of them and he opens this by saying that they're all super brave and he reminds them of the whole like Polyphemus incident. And he's like, remember how he did that, look how amazing we are, like, oh, we're these really strong men. And as he explains, he chooses not to explain Scylla, actually, he starts to explain Charybdis and, and what they're gonna face with this whole whirlpool thing, because he decides that Scylla is just gonna freak them out over nothing and he doesn't want them to be distracted by that. So he warns them about Charybdis and as he's explaining this, all of a sudden they can start hearing like the waves breaking against like rock and on shore up ahead. So they know what they're about to come across and all the men start like getting quite terrified and nervous and they're all sitting and they're, you know, still by their oars and they're going forward. And as they're doing that, Odysseus goes to put on his armor because he decides he knows better than Cersei in this moment, which obviously we all know he doesn't know better than Cersei. So he puts on all his armor and he thinks he's gonna fight off Scylla, not knowing how massive she is. And bear in mind, nobody else is prepared for Scylla whatsoever. So the men start rolling past Charybdis and Charybdis starts doing a whole like swallowing of the water and spitting it back up and all of this. And the men are terrified. Like they've never seen anything like this. Like Odysseus describes it like a little abyss in the sea, how like when she sucks it all in, it just goes into this black hole and then she spits it all back up. Like it's, the, the men are terrified to the point where they are all on one side of the boat staring over into Charybdis. And as they're distracted, by this, Scylla comes out of nowhere and she just, her head's come out, picks up six of the men. Like they're not even focused on it. And so when Odysseus turns around, by the time he actually sees this happening, all the men are already in the air and he can't even attack Scylla. So his armor was all for nothing. And one question that I have is why weren't the men kind of like, hey, why is Odysseus all of a sudden armored up? Like, isn't that really terrifying that he wants to fight off water? Is that what they thought? I'm curious, I have no idea. But Odysseus loses six of his men in this moment to six of Scylla's heads. And that's sort of it. They just start like rolling through um, between the two of them and the rest of them get out safely. Very anticlimactic. I gather, but that's the episode in the book that you're like all geared up for this thing and it happens within like a paragraph. However, we then reach the island of this name. I obviously cannot pronounce this. A Greek person let us know. I don't know if it's like Thrinacia, Thrinakia, whatever it is. Just let me know in the comments, please. I love it when people write things out phonetically because I love learning from everybody. So they end up coming across this island and it's right now that Odysseus tells his men that they actually shouldn't stop at all. He decides that he's just going to avoid the whole thing, the whole warning. And so he says, you know what? Let's just keep saying it. I'm gonna sail through the night. We're gonna go to the next island. Island. Now it's in this moment that Yuri Locus gets up and he starts fighting with Odysseus because he says, look man, I don't know what the big deal is about this island just yet. However, we're exhausted. Like how are we supposed to sail for a whole other night given we just went past the sirens. We just did the whole Scylla and Charybdis thing. We just lost six men. We need to rest. Now Odysseus knows after he's spoken that he's won against an entire army because now all of them are like cheering for Yuri Locus and they all agree with him because they all really, they just really want to get off the boat and they just want to like chill the fuck out. So Odysseus knows that and he says to them like, okay, I get it. I get it's one man against everybody else. So I'm not going to sit here and fight with you guys. But what I need from you is to swear an oath that you will only eat the mortal food that we have with us on the ship on board and not touch any of the cattle that they come across. He's like, that is the only thing that you 100% have to do and you have to swear an oath now in order for me to say okay to this. And obviously all the men are just like, yeah, sure, whatever. I don't really give a f Swear the oath and then get off the island and they just chill out. Now the men, to be fair to them, before they start being dumb, they do start off really strong, okay? So they're only eating all of the stuff that they brought with them. They're only drinking all the stuff that they brought with them. They are, they are holding up their end of the bargain. However, nobody anticipated they would be stuck there for an entire month, which means that obviously the food that they brought starts to dwindle very, very, very quickly. You're trying to feed all of these grown men. We're talking about like, what, 38? grown men that you're trying to feed, that sh is not gonna last. And it doesn't, unsurprisingly. So the men have to start hunting, but they've obviously, they can't touch the cattle. So they're hunting for like, you know, birds and fish and all of this. And they are getting really, really hungry. Like they are starting to starve. And Odysseus is aware of this and being the great leader that he is, he decides that he's gonna go and pray to the gods. So he goes inland and he, you know, performs all of these rites and everything, starts praying to the gods and being like, please save me and my men and all of this. But unfortunately when he's there, he just like gets really, really tired and he falls asleep. He takes this really long nap. And as we know, as I've mentioned before in this series, whenever Odysseus naps, it is never good, ever. So this is one of those times that it comes back to bite him because obviously when he doesn't return to all of the men, the men on the beach, Yuri Locus, more specifically, he stands up and he's like, hey, so all of us are starving to death at this point. Odysseus clearly doesn't give a 
because otherwise he would tell us to go and eat the cattle because it is way worse to die of starvation than it is anything else. And he says that if it so happens that the gods want to kill all of the men after they have killed this cattle, then so be it. He says it's a much better way to die than it is to die of starvation on a foreign land because they really just want to go home. He wants to live to see another day. They're willing to take the risk, which again is dumb. And they swore an oath on top of this, so it's also problematic. There are just numerous issues with this, but either way, all of the men decide that they're going to cheer in approval. And Jiridakis says that because they're going to go and kill the cattle that they know is now to the sun god, that they are going to then, when they get back to Ithaca, they're going to erect a temple to him and they're going to fill it with gifts and all of this in order to say thanks for letting them, you know, live and survive and all of this. So all the men agree to this and they all go to find the cattle to go and kill it. Now, to be fair, I want to start again by just saying that to be fair to them, they do all of the appropriate sacrificing and it's very respectful, okay? They don't just go kill them and then just like start feasting on like raw flesh or anything like that. Like they go, they do prayers, they slaughter them appropriately, they offer parts to the gods and all of this. So it's done correctly. It's just the only, literally the only thing that they're not supposed to be doing. And you're reading it like, are you, f are you serious? Come on guys. In this moment, Odysseus wakes up and he starts walking back towards the beach where all of them are supposed to be, but he can smell like a roast. He can smell basically like roast dinner coming out and he's just like, are you serious right now? And obviously the gods are already three steps ahead. So the goddesses who are supposed to be guarding all of the, the, the cattle and all of this, they see this happening and they go immediately to tell Helios what's up. They're just like, hey, by the way, the men killed your cattle. And Helios is pissed as we expect him to be. He's super mad. And so Helios immediately in this moment goes to Zeus and he goes, look, if you don't make sure that those men pay in blood, for my beautiful cattle, then I'm gonna take the sun and I'm gonna go down to the underworld and I'm gonna make sure that it rays sunshine in the underworld instead of up here in the mortal world because I'm mad. Obviously Zeus in response to this is like, I need you to chill the f out, don't worry, we'll handle it, we'll make sure that they do pay. What I'm gonna do is that they're gonna be fine for now, but when they get back on the boat, I'm gonna send them a storm, we're gonna send down a lightning bolt and kill them all. So don't even worry, don't throw a little hissy fit about bringing the sun to the underworld, relax. Mainly because Helios in this moment does have a really cute speech where he talks about how it's like his favorite thing when he's going across the sky to look down on the cattle and to be like, those are my babies, oh my God, I love them. The fact that they are now killed is a big thing for him. Remember how I said the whole like car thing, like we need to picture like an old man with his like nice shiny, old, nice car. I don't even know types of cars to say right now, but you know, one of those situations, like imagine getting a scratch, imagine totaling that car. Imagine how that old man would react. That is exactly how Helios is reacting right now. Now, Odysseus says in real time, like as he's telling the Phaeacians, that the only way he knows about this conversation that happened between the gods is because he heard it from Calypso when he was stranded on her island and Calypso heard it from Hermes. So it's like a whole he said, she said, this is the information that he has though. So this is the story that we're going with basically. I just feel like you guys should know that. So back to the story moment, Odysseus reaches the ships, all of the men are eating all of the cattle. He tells them off, he does yell at them. And he's just like, this is the dumbest thing that you guys have ever done. Like, I cannot believe you swore an oath and you still did this one thing I told you not to. But surprisingly, they're okay for like six days. They're feasting for six days and nothing happens. And on the seventh day, a wind picks up so they know that they can keep, you know, journeying home basically. And very long story short, they get back on the boat. They're like now in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the sea and when they're out there Zeus sends down a storm and more importantly he sends down this lightning bolt to the stern of the ship where it hits and it you know kills a bunch of the men and in fact Odysseus is the only man to survive this little shipwreck moment and in fact the storm ends up pushing him back on the remains of the boat all the way back to where Charybdis and Scylla are right so Odysseus is like well this isn't good. Gets all the way back to the whirlpool and he ends up hanging on to this fig tree that was there that I just didn't mention and now I'm realizing I didn't mention before but there's a description of a fig tree that hangs over. Anyways, so he hangs on to that fig tree right now and when Charybdis sort of pulls everything into her little whirlpool thing and then spits everything back out, Odysseus manages to find some sort of wood that he can use as a boat, something else that he can use as an oar and that's how he gets away on basically like planks of of wood and he sails this way. He sails in this like raft thing for like nine days. Okay, he's just on the open sea totally by himself, completely traumatized because of the idiocy of his own men who are now dead because of it. And so on the 10th day, he appears at Ojigia. He says that the gods sent him to Ojigia, where then he ends up being stranded with Calypso 
for a total of seven years being kept as a prisoner there. And when we snap back to the present moment of him explaining this to the Phaeacians, he says, all of you know exactly how the story ends because I've already told you how I got from Calypso's Island to here. So um, yeah, that's the end of my story. And that is the end of the book. So that's very exciting that now we have finished off this whole backstory of how Odysseus has, has gone on this whole crazy mythological journey with all of these monsters and everything like that. So when we pick up in the next book, the next book is book 13, and when we pick up there, we are now going to finally have him go back to Ithaca and meet up with Penelope again and his family and the suitors and face all of that um, whole thing. But this is the end of all of the, uh, the monsters and the magic and all of that sort of stuff. But yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning into this book. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll be seeing you next time with more videos about the Odyssey here on Monique. We'll see you then. Bye.